Clinic presents Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. Welcome to the Grand Rounds episode for March 2024. This is Always on EM, a Mayo Clinic podcast, and I am Venk Bellamconda. And Alex Finch and I both co host this podcast for you all, and we appreciate you tuning in. Today, we share with you one of our senior resident capstone presentations presented by Dr. Rebecca Leff, and it's titled Fit for Purpose, Emergency Medicine Physicians and Humanitarian Response in Complex Emergencies. The talk is an overview of the structure of humanitarian response, the realities of providing care in these settings, and a voice of advocacy for the people depending upon the world's support in these times. This is a talk the likes of which I have not heard in my career and is shared by a physician who has built her already distinguished career in this space. The beginning 10 minutes of the audio is challenging because there are some uh, video clips that she is sharing that have audio that competes with her voice at times. But we think the message is powerful enough and important enough that it's worth your time to go through and worth our time to share. So please bear with it as I think you'll find the same when you hear her insights. To do a more formal introduction of Dr. Leff is one of our colleagues, friends, and a truly remarkable person in his own right, Dr. Colin Bucks. Hello, my name is Colin Bucks, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rebecca Leff. Dr. Leff is one of our graduating emergency medicine residents. In addition to being a stellar resident, she has developed extensive expertise on advancing emergency care for children in low and lower middle income countries and in conflict settings. She completed her undergraduate education at the University of California, Berkeley, with a degree in Middle Eastern Studies, Political Science, with concentrations in International Relations and Film and Media Studies. She's also received a certificate in inter- interdisciplinary human rights from UC Berkeley. So with all this said, she's a political scientist who understands international relations and makes films. Just hope you all get the summary. Thank you. Um, she received her MD with a certificate in global health from Ben Gurion University in, ben- in Beersheba, Israel. Additionally, Rebecca completed a research year with the Yale Emergency Medicine Global Health Section. And in some total, this equates to an enormously strong foundation for her future in global health endeavors. As Dr. Leff completed her formal education over the past decade, she has simultaneously worked in the human rights sector with organizations including, and forgive me, I'll go slowly, Physicians for Human Rights Israel, the Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, the Center for International Migration and Integration, the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, Save a Child's Heart, and the Olive Tree Initiative, throughout the Middle East and including the Palestinian territories, Turkey and Ghana. Rebecca holds multiple chair and co-chair positions with SAM and ASEP academic committees and recently received awards from SAM, although forgive me, she didn't detail these. Um, I was present and very proud of her. She'll be starting a combined fellowship this next year in pediatric emergency medicine with global health at the Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School this July. Having personal experience in the film uh, in the realm of global health, and with all this said, it is hard for me to imagine any resident anywhere more qualified to speak to the subject. With that, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rebecca Leff. Thank you, Dr. Bucks. Okay. So my first moments when I became a doctor really revolved around this sound. It starts with a deafening siren and within 10 seconds they're here, a volley of rockets exploding overhead. this Israeli hospital comes under attack. As a medical student, I spent time, as I was learning medicine, working under rocket fire overhead 
Sometimes it meant being a medical student and providing care, and sometimes it meant caring for the doctor's children and creating a makeshift uh, daycare. Sometimes it meant being pulled from my ophthalmology rotation to work in the emergency department to provide care and hiding and, and trying to cover myself as rockets were coming overhead so we wouldn't get hit by shrapnel. Sometimes it meant being a phlebotomist, and sometimes it meant being really the first moment where I really thought of myself as a doctor when a nurse told me, you need to go to the shelter. And I said, nope, not going to do that. I'm going to stay with my patient on BiPAP who's anxious because I don't know how to do anything else, but I know how to sit with my patient and try to calm them down. And most of the time we ignore the rockets because we think that they're probably fine. But then there are moments like these where this is where I learned um, OBGYN. The residents actually moved the patients who were delivering their children from this um, this war just an hour before this occurred. And this is an entire destruction of the operating rooms and the OBGYN facility, as well as the Center for Developmental Pediatrics. But really, I want to start by telling you a story of four boys. It starts with this sound. <laughs> And that's the sound that occurred on June 12th, 2014, when four boys changed my life, even though I never met them. There were three boys, Gilad Shar, Neftali Flanker, and Ayal Yifrach, which were kidnapped um, on that day. And the entire country was with them. There were people crying on the streets. There was also hope. We were listening to the mothers. And I remember hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people going to the Kotel, the holiest place in Jerusalem for Jews, and praying. And I remember going down to the Kotel and watching them. And then with all of that hope and all of that anxiety and all that stress, we learned on June 30th, 2014, that the bodies of the three boys were found in a field near Hebron after being kidnapped by Hamas. And I remember that moment for so many reasons, one of which was that my friend, one of my closest friends who was an Israeli Arab who was currently on the other side of Jerusalem, called me and said, I can't come home. They're screaming death to Arabs in the streets. And I remember the calls, Nikama, 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 revenge. And I remember this moment because I went to go get him. And as we were coming back, all I said to him was, don't talk. I don't want anyone to hear your Arab accent. And I was embarrassed. And there were really no words for what I was seeing because it was not just sadness for the death of these three young children who were coming home from school, but it was an absolute despair looking around me and feeling, where are we going with our conflict? And I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned this is a story not of three boys, but of four young boys. And on July 2nd, 2014, the horror that I experienced really went deeper as I watched three young Jewish boys kidnap and burn alive Muhammad Abu Khadir, who was also a young teenager who was just like now getting ready for Ramadan prayers in the morning. And this happened maybe five minutes from where I was living. And those are his parents, just like the parents of Eyal Ifrah that you saw on the slide before. I think as I was learning and as we went to war at this time, there were Molotov cocktails on the streets and the police and Palestinian forces were all over East Jerusalem. And during that time, I saw a young boy who was seizing in the middle of the street and I called for an ambulance and nobody would come. The Israeli ambulance said, we're not going over there. There's rocks being thrown at ambulances. We're absolutely not going to East Jerusalem. And at the same time, the Palestinian ambulance couldn't come from a roadblock. And so I gathered with my fantastic Arabic, it's not that fantastic, <laughs> with my fantastic Arabic, a group of people to try to get this um, boy to the hospital, um, which was Hadassah um, in East Jerusalem. And we ended up um, caring for him. And then I stayed for the next six months and decided I wanted to be an emergency medicine physician. And I decided that because medicine allowed me to go across geographic borders it allowed me to go to areas of the West Bank where Israeli citizens weren't allowed and I could provide care. It allowed me to cross borders between people. 
to work with people I never could have connected with because we were there for the shared goal of providing medical care. And to, they understood that I was there to help. And it also allowed me, importantly, to cross borders of indecisiveness. Because despite the stalemate in our protracted conflict in the region, when I worked in medicine, I could improve the health of people in conflict, even while the conflict lingered on indefinitely, and we could move forward to do something for public health. So I told you why I care about health and conflict, but you should care too. In 2023, Conflict deaths surged by 96% to 238,000, reaching the highest levels this century. Some of you might be thinking about Ukraine, and some of you might be thinking of Gaza. But 79 countries saw increased conflict levels in 2023. Among them, Ethiopia, that has an ongoing genocide, Myanmar, and Haiti has had increased conflict over the past couple of weeks, um, resulting in increased um, humanitarian efforts um, in Port-au-Prince. And if that wasn't enough, there's also an economic impact of violence. And that increased by 17% in 2023 to $17.5 trillion. Imagine how much effort and money is going into these conflicts. That's 13% of the world GDP. Today we're going to take a second, this is going to be a brief overview of humanitarian um, interventions. I can't say everything, but we're going to hit some of the he key points. So we're going to state the basic principles of humanitarian aid. We'll identify key health needs of populations affected by humanitarian crisis and how emergency medicine clinicians can respond to these needs with the greatest impact. We're going to talk about how can we engage in humanitarian aid responsibly. How do we apply the principles of no harm that we talk about when we practice in our emergency departments into humanitarian in interventions? And we're going to talk about some of my thoughts about how humanitarianism are, is developing and, and really adapting to improve response. So we're in for a wild ride, so bear with me for a second. For emergency medicine physicians, we have skills that we can bring into um, you know, humanitarian interventions. But it's not like, okay, I'm an emergency medicine physician, I'm automatically needed. That's not really how it works. We bring to humanitarian intervention an ability to manage disorganization. I think we all know what that feels like when the emergency department has no control, we're working under extreme time pressures, and we are doing so in a way that would be adaptable, but not immediately transferable to the humanitarian field. We know how to work in team environments and we know how to delegate. And sometimes we work with teams that we're not really familiar with. And that is useful in humanitarian aid when you're working with teams or you might not know the other team members. We have a broad knowledge base of medicine. We know how to treat ACS in one room and then go and treat a neonate in another room. We know how to deal with OBGYN emergencies, which is critical in humanitarian aid. Hopefully all of us feel comfortable to a certain extent dealing with social emergencies, dealing with persons who might speak another language than ours, and maybe persons who don't have, who are engaged with poverty or homelessness. We know how to try to get our patients what they need in a dysfunctional healthcare system. I, I think we all have talked to Sapphire enough to know that we try to get patients where they need to go, and that's part of our job. And we are experts in making difficult decisions when we don't have a lot of reliable information. We manage vastly different patients. Sometimes we have a patient with anaphylaxis in one room, but then I'm spending you know, an unbelievable amount of time with a patient who really has a social emergency medicine. Maybe they're here with alcoholism or something else in the room next door. And sometimes um, we have scheduling flexibility, which can be useful um, to deploying. But, and I can't stress this enough, the fact that we are emergency medicine physicians doesn't mean that we can go abroad and oh, we're ready to go. Special training and expertise is required to work in humanitarian settings. It's a profession. It's its own field. Training and experience in emergency public health can really not be understated because a lot of what you're doing working as a physician in these settings is also working as a public health officer, collecting data and making decisions. Mayo Clinic is perhaps the farthest thing that I can imagine from an austere condition when we have the male and female um, cath teams. But 
working in austere conditions means that we have to figure out ways to do the things that we typically do in our emergency departments and really transferring that to a different type of condition. We need to understand a little bit more about um, common health problems among displaced persons. Um, for example, measles, meningitis, TB, malnutrition, tropical disease medicine and infectious disease expertise is another key thing that we don't always have the knowledge but need to gather before we go and intervene in humanitarian um, emergencies. I cannot state enough how important it is to know what the political situation you're getting yourself into. Who are the actors? Who is doing what? That's your responsibility when you go to a humanitarian emergency. It's also under, it's, it's very important to understand the languages you're going to be working with. Cultural training, MSF, for example, talks a lot about um, French knowledge. I think Arabic knowledge is another really key point given that 28 countries speak Arabic. Knowledge of international humanitarian law and principles that we all share as the foundation for the work that we do. And while some of us have EMS training and have better knowledge of triage, mass casualty and disaster management, this is in our wheeled house as emergency medicine physicians, but is not automatic and needs further training to work in this field. So defining disaster, I think there's a million different definitions. This is the International Red Cross definition. But I think the key thing is something happens and all of a sudden there's not enough resources to deal with that thing that just happened. And that society is unable to cope using its own resources to get back to its usual state. Today, we're going to be talking about complex humanitarian emergencies. And really, this t tends to be a definition that applies to armed conflict and, and really political armed conflict. And the reason it's special is because you have that same breakdown that you would have in, say, a natural disaster. But where's your government? It's gone. There's no authority that's responding to that crisis, and that makes it complex. And typically, the UN defines this as something that um, also requires more than the capacity of just their usual UN country program as well. I'm going to take a step back here just for a second. Bear with me as we talk a little bit about the foundations of humanitarianism and how we got to where we are today. In 1859, there was a Swiss businessman, a Seventh-day Adventist, Henry Dunant, who went to visit wounded soldiers after the Battle of Soferino in 1859, which was a battle between Austria and Napoleon forces. What he saw there shocked him. He couldn't imagine uh, really the despair and just the horrible condition of the soldiers. Um, he wrote in one paragraph, that they were dying in, in convulsions that ended in tetanus and death, and they were calling out in distress for a doctor and nobody was coming to help. And this prompted him to write this book, A Memoir of Selferino. And at the end of this book, he wrote the following statement. Would it not be possible, he writes, in times of peace and quiet to form relief societies for the purpose of having care given to the wounded in wartime by zealous, devoted, and thoroughly qualified volunteers. And it was this statement that founded first the uh, International Committee for Relief to the Wounded, which was five individuals. And that grew to the International Committee of the Red Cross as we know it today. And this was different than anything that had ever been written before because it talked not only about the art of war, but focused on the welfare of combatants and non-combatants. So in 1863, we get the founding of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And this had many offshoots. For example, Clara Barton in the U.S. during her experience in the Civil War founded the American Red Cross, which is an offshoot of this. In 1864, 12 nations founded a covenant with the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, as the custodian of that covenant. And it stated that the ICRC was going to be a neutral party that could provide aid to civilians. What a novel concept and could help remove wounded soldiers and ill combatants from the field. In 1899 and 1907, the Hague Conventions established restrictions on the type of warfare that could be applied. Certain tactics, strategies, and weapons of war were prohibited really for the first time. And if you think about this, this is also the time that we're starting to develop not only international humanitarian law, but we're also developing international relations. The League of Nations was founded in 1919, and subsequently in 1924, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child was signed, 
at the bolstering of Save the Children, which was really the first NGO that was not sponsored by government. And this said for the first time that children have a right to relief in armed conflict. It sounds really obvious, but here it was codified in international law. In 1944, the Charter of the United Nations was signed. And in the ashes of World War II, which is important because it founds the, the way that international law was really founded, we have the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the additional protocols. This was the beginning of international law. These are the foundations. And it's important to understand that it's based off of World War II because what it means is some of the things are a little bit outdated and don't really apply to the way that we have conflicts today. 1971 is a flashpoint. There were a lot of different conflicts kind of around the 60s and 70s. Um, Cambodia was a big flashpoint. Biaf uh, Biafra and Nigeria was one such flashpoint. And it's important because it founded MSF, Doctors Without Borders, as some of you might know it. And what happened was that in May 1967, the Republic of Biafra in Southeast Nigeria broke off from the rest of the country, and it was followed by a very bloody civil conflict. And the government of Nigeria actually cut off Bi uh, Biafra um, with oil revenue and resulted in a very, very significant famine. The ICRC was banned from providing aid that was not first checked by the Nigerian government and not approved by the Nigerian government. And the result said, we're not neutral, which, as you remember, was their initial covenant, so they pulled out. And this was a, a, a conflict where 3,000 children were dying a day, and there was nobody providing aid. And so in the wake of this, Doctors at Borders was founded to say, we're not okay with this. We think that we should provide aid, and we think that we should speak out. And so you start to see the ways that which some of these concepts, which are obvious, or sound obvious, are actually quite hard to apply in reality. And in 1998, we found the Rome Statute, um, which creates the International Criminal Court. I want to take a second to sort of define and a little bit go deeper into the Geneva Conventions because they're just so foundational. International humanitarian law, which is based primarily, but not only, of course, on the Geneva Conventions, uh, only applies to armed conflicts. For international armed conflicts, which means conflict between two states, for example, if you were to have a war between France and the United States, um, you have the four Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 1. And for non-international armed conflicts, primarily this is based on, on Common Article 3, which is sort of hinted at throughout all of the Geneva Conventions. This distinction is important because if we think about conflicts today, if you start thinking in your head about the different conflicts that we see, you'll realize that a lot of these are non-state actors. If we think about, for example, the war in Syria, this is Syria and then several non-state actors. If we think about war in Lebanon, it's Lebanon and Hezbollah, which is a non-state actor. And this is important because these treaties don't apply in the same way. They're much more nebulous and much less clear. That being said, there still are protections against things like taking hostages um, and against torture. The Geneva Conventions, in the most brief fashion, so Geneva Convention 1 talks about armed forces in the field, and why it's relevant to us is that it talks about humane treatment of wounded and sick persons in the battlefield and offers protection for medical personnel. Geneva Convention 2, exactly the same thing, but now we're talking about at sea. Geneva Convention 3 talks about treatment of prisoners of war, which is important for, for physicians because we are part of the custodian, part of the a team that will often uh, see prisoners at war. And the ICRC um, is one of the, the groups that actually goes to visit uh, prisoners of war and, and does medical examinations. And those protections come from the Geneva Convention 3. Geneva Convention 4 is critically important because it provides legal protections for civilian and civilian objects, such as hospitals, in conflict. And some of you might be saying, well, what about those like other times when we're not quite in a conflict, but maybe we're in a conflict. Well, there's a whole other body of international law for that, and that's international human rights law. And this applies in peace times and conflict times all the time. There are certain rights that can be restricted in a public health emergency or a public emergency, but there are other rights that are deemed non-derogable. For example, the prohibit uh, prohibition on torture, which applies no matter what is going on. There are several treaties in which international human rights law is founded upon, the most sort of critical of those being the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about 30 articles or 30 fundamental rights that all persons are 
uh, permitted to, for example, um, right of protection despite you know language, religion, race, uh, political opinion, or a national or social origin. Um, and there's several others, ex for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then there's this whole other nebulous little area of international law that involves um, customary international law, which is no signed treaty, but states just kind of agree on norms and then we sort of just follow them. And I say this here to talk a little bit about when we talk about laws in the domestic sense, we say, OK, if you kill somebody, you're going to jail. There's a punishment. Well, what happens in international law? Does any of this actually even matter? Well, there's the ICJ, which settles disputes between states, and there's the ICC, which prosecutes individuals. And these are the worst things you can imagine that the ICC prosecutes, right? This is genocide. This is crimes against humanity, war crimes. Despite having this mandate since the 90s, they've issued only 40 arrest warrants, and they've only convicted 10 people. 10 people. And you say, OK, but I bet those 10 people really had a significant punishment. Well, if we look at, for example, Lubanga from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, this is a person who destroyed personally 26 villages. He killed over 350 people. He forced 60,000 people to flee their homes. And at one point, human rights organizations said that he had 3,000 child soldiers and he was released from prison from the ICC um, custody on March 15th, 2020, after he served a 14 year sentence. That's it. And I say all this to say that international law doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. Um, and at least I think that's that's kind of a common understanding. And that's important not only as we move more into non-international armed conflicts, like I mentioned, which makes all of this much more complicated, but it also means that people don't follow the rules. In 2022, it marked the most violent year against healthcare workers working in humanitarian emergencies. This is a diagram by Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition, which talks about 1,989 attacks against healthcare facilities and personnel across 32 countries. That was a 45% increase in 2022 alone. You can see this is the number of healthcare workers who are killed, kidnapped, injured, arrested. The number is going up. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but I think it's important to understand that a lot of these norms and these international laws that we talk about aren't always applied. And there's a lot of reasons, but part of it is the, the idea that we're working more in non-international armed conflicts. When you go to engage in humanitarian response, there are certain principles that become the foundations of humanitarianism. These are the foundation for humanitarian action in the field, and they're critical because they help distinguish humanitarian actors from all other actors that are participating in a conflict field. And they gain acceptance for your participation and your right to be um, in a particular location, and to a certain extent also discuss your security, because the second that you're seen as not impartial or you're not independent or you're not neutral, then why is, this, uh, why is the Israeli army going to allow you to, to act? And so this becomes a, a really important piece about why are you allowed to be there and your own security. The Taliban for, might say that you're not an independent actor just by the fact that you come from the United States and you don't share their cultural norms. And so while these concepts seem kind of obvious, they're really not. Humanity, for example, I think is the most, I don't know, straightforward of these concepts. Humanity says that human suffering should be addressed wherever it is found that the purpose of humanitarian action is to protect life, health, and ensure respect for human beings. I'm sure no one is here when I'm saying these words saying, oh, I wonder that, I mean, I don't agree with that. I don't think anybody would say that. But if you think about it, it's actually more complicated because if my job as a humanitarian actor is to protect life and, and really ensure respect for human beings, where does that end? Does that end just with that conflict? Or let's say in Afghanistan, as an example that I mentioned, does that mean that I should start building schools? That's more development. But then if I do that, then the Taliban's not going to be very happy with me because what am I teaching in those schools? And did I let women into the schools? And there's all these kind of things that make this less clear as to where is my cutoff. We talked about neutrality with Biafra and how complicated that was, which the concept of neutrality says that humanitarian actors must not take sides in hostilities. But 
does the fact that we're not allowed to act mean that we shouldn't? And that was the discussion between ICRC and MSF. Impartiality, that humanitarian action should be carried out based on need alone, giving priority to the most urgent cases of distress. Well, if I go to a conflict and I say, for example, um, that I'm going to focus on Rohingya refugees because they have the most need, I don't know how the Myanmar government is going to feel about that. They might not think that's impartial. We talked a little bit about independence, that you should be independent from any other political, economic, military, other objective. You may feel you're independent, but are you truly independent? Does my citizenship from a country mean that I'm not independent? All of these things play, play a role here, but also are the foundational principles of humanitarianism. Briefly, to just understand how this tech tends to be discussed, I want to just briefly mention the phases of crisis. You have your pre-emergency phase, which honestly, I can't stress enough how important the pre-emergency phase to, is to making any of the rest of this go well. And this is the phase before the disaster. This is when you do your planning. For example, the Israeli hospital at Sheba, which is um, in well near Tel Aviv, um, has an 800-bed hospital that was built into a parking garage. And essentially now they're moving all of their operations down into the parking garage and they already have oxygen and everything hooked up. And so they could just move down there um, to avoid rocket fire. This involves supplies, shelter, planning, evacuation routes, and really trying to plan where is going to be my referral system, who's going to have what, and the planning is key. Your acute emergency phase is really when the, like, you're immediately, the disaster just happened, the conflict just started. And this is when you really just try to keep people alive. This is when you work on food, shelter. Post-emergency phase, you start to really bring back public health and really establish um, your basic public health as the, the uh, mortality rates start to lower. And in the recovery phase, you start to work again on development and going back to the state that you were in. Briefly, because I told you public health is important, the acute emergency phase is typically um, identified by crude mortality rate and under five mortality rate. And typically people say that when this doubles, that's when your emergency starts. And if you don't know what the previous baseline was, then it's usually one uh, per 10,000 of the crude mortality rate, which is the number of deaths per 10,000 persons, or an under five mortality rate of over two per 10,000 persons per day. This is kind of how the calculation works um, for those who want to take a look at this later. As physicians in conflict, we're pulled in so many different directions. We're pulled toward mental health and providing psychological first aid. We're pulled toward trauma. And typically this involves crush injuries, fractures, amputations, blast injuries, ballistic injuries. We're pulled to take care of people with malnutrition, children with malnutrition. We're pulled toward what everyone typically talks about, which is communicable diseases. And that's not just people having cholera and diarrheal diseases and measles, but also what about all the people who had HIV and TB before? How are they going to get their medicines? That's a medicine they have to take every day. And then my particular baby of the topic, which is non-communicable diseases. And that's not just hypertension, diabetes, but what about the patients with DKA? What do you think happens to a patient who has type 1 diabetes when they can't get access to their insulin in a conflict? What about COPD when you don't have access to your inhaler? The top 10 priorities in conflict are typically listed as follows. We're going to touch on these just very briefly because I'm kind of doing an overarching skim procedure here. You have your initial assessment, your measles immunization. Measles is typically kind of considered the most important, but there are others too. Um, pertussis diphtheria are often talked about as well as the antibiotic prophylaxis. Yellow fever is often given if there's more than one case identified, but not prophylactically until that one case is identified. Polio is often given. And now Ebola um, is being discussed as, as another vaccine that may be given in particular context um, after experience in the DRC that had pretty good results. Uh, water and sanitation is critical. Chlorination of water, where you're getting your water sources. This is a public health emergency. Food and nutrition, shelter and site planning. The healthcare in the emergency phase, which is not just treating people who have injuries, but also restoring basic service delivery and primary care, communicable disease control, continuing your public health surveillance, continued training and coordination. And a lot of this really goes back to your initial assessment. When you go to, even before you even think about going to a crisis zone, it's important to consider what the assessment is, what is actually going on in that location. 
And some of this can be broken down into a crisis impact versus operational environment. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you're trying to identify how can I help the most people and what are the barriers in my way? Well, in terms of your crisis impact, you might say this geographic region I've identified as needing the most help. You might identify specific at-risk populations, for example, a particular ethnicity, geriatric population, which everybody forgets, um, maybe people with diabetes like we just talked about. Maybe um, you're talking about, sorry, um, and then maybe you're talking about what are the political constraints that are making it difficult for you to enact that. So for example, this road is closed or I need to go through this checkpoint. I need to know that before I start kind of arranging my operational, um, my operational strategy. You also need to know where the gaps are. Maybe the local response is doing a really great job with people who have diabetes, but maybe they totally don't have anything in place right now for people who have cholera. You need to think, for example, just to kind of give you an example of how this might work to say, okay, if I don't have a ventilator at my facility and I'm gonna intubate somebody, where am I gonna send them once I intubate them? Where are they gonna go? How far can I really bag somebody? And starting to think about these kind of things are critical because if you don't know where you're gonna go and you don't know how your, your referral system is connecting, it's really hard to go forward. And the other piece of this, which cannot really be understated, unfortunately, is that you're also kind of trying to justify to your funders, well, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it so that you can give me money, which is also important, unfortunately. And you thought that the public health was done after you did your initial assessment, it's not. Your initial assessment is often a brief, kind of good enough qualitative uh, sampling. This is not a well-planned research study. This is, let me get the best data I can right now to enact a um, intervention. It's often a convenience sample at the level of the community and often involves um, you know, asking key actors, like for example, maybe a local community leader information or doing household surveys. You need dedicated assessment staff and it's often cross-sectional. But as the emergency goes on, you need to continue to do surveillance. For example, and of why this is important, um, you know, typically for measles immunization, the recommended age to do measles immunization is six months to 14 years in conflict. And that's kind of the, the recommendation um, for most of the guidelines. However, um, there was a case, for example, in, of Somalian refugees in Ethiopia and Kenya, where they found that the, the rates just kept going up and up and up. And they used their surveillance data to say, actually, most of our new cases are in age 15 plus, so 15 to 30. And so they then use their surveillance data to say, OK, I'm going to expand my immunization campaign to include older peer persons. And that started to lower the level. And this is the kind of data that you'll probably be expected to collect because this is by routine healthcare staff like doctors. It's longitudinal and it's individual level quantitative data typically. And if you thought you were done with that, well now once you have your intervention, you have to say, did it work? Did it do what it's supposed to do? And that is a whole other field and I could give a whole other lecture on it. And that's monitoring and evaluation, which is kind of a mix of qualitative, quantitative, it involves surveys, interviews, uh, focus groups. It's also cross-sectional. But, but this is really important to say, um, you know, what is the relevance of what I'm doing? What is the effectiveness? What is the impact? And really importantly, what is the sustainability? So for example, were my objectives achieved? Did I pick the right objectives? Was it time efficient? Was it cost efficient? How many people did I help? What difference did I make? And critically important, after my funding ends, what is going to happen? If I go and I do a surgical intervention, who is gonna do my post-surgical follow-up? What happens when I leave? Nutrition is a, a really big topic in humanitarian emergencies. You have to think about macronutrients, micronutrients. Zinc is critically important because it's been shown to reduce all-cause mortality in children and reduces uh, incidence of diarrheal and pneumonia-related mortality. Vitamin A is also critical in measles. And you have to think of your populations at increased risk. For example, children under five, geriatric populations, pregnant populations, lactating populations, your politically marginalized populations, and the ever-discussed malnutrition infection cycle. And that is to say that, for example, I'm, I have malnutrition, I am more likely to get sick with said infectious illness, and then that said infectious illness, for example, parasite or cholera, then makes me more malnourished and I can't get out of that cycle.
I also just want to highlight here that there's a focus a lot of times on people who are underweight in conflict. There's also a lot of discussion about overweight and obese populations. In a Palestinian refugee camp in the West Bank, 14.5% of children were overweight and 15.7% were obese. And that kind of tracks with my experience working in those settings. And so your, your interventions really need to address that as well. Severe acute malnutrition, this is the, the way that this is typically measured, which is the mid-upper arm circumference. And I won't bore you with the numbers, but typically um, less than 115 millimeters in, indicates severe acute malnutrition. And the weight for height score, negative three, is the uh, sort of the indicator for severe acute malnutrition. And typically we talk about discharge criteria as being over 125 millimeters for your mid-arm circumference and a negative 1.5 z-score for the weight for height score. Um, and if you have pitting edema, um, you sort of get into this category regardless of what those numbers are. And just as a mentioner, the Kwashiorkor and Marasmus approach is the same. A lot of the discussions about protein versus non-protein has now been sort of thought to be outdated and is no longer really a consideration. Just to kind of look at how this might look like um, if you were treating someone with malnutrition, oftentimes you'll use the F75 as your kind of starter um, milk uh, protein, uh, you know, packet, and then you go to the F100, and that's sort of how many calories per, um, that's how many calories per, um, per milliliter, per 100 milliliter, excuse me. And so you're kind of increasing as you go along, and then you're also adding a ready-to-use supplemental food, which is typically something like a chickpea-based or pro uh, peanut-based um, bar, and you can see an example of that here as you move to your outpatient phase, which involves still the supplemental of the RUTF, the ready to use supplemental foods, but then also um, just normal foods and discharge. And it's not just that, right? Because in conflict zones, it's a little bit different than here. You give prophylactic antibiotics, usually amoxicillin for prophylaxis, you test for malaria, HIV, and TB, or you just do a clinical assessment for those things. And you empirically treat for parasites because they're so common, usually with a bendazole. And you also have to make sure you're giving your vitamin supplementation. And usually that involves some combination of vitamin A, B vitamins, iodine, folic acid, zinc, and iron. Communicable diseases, despite the fact that I like to talk about non-communicable diseases, are critically important. When you have humanitarian emergencies, even war, you might be thinking about the ballistic injuries and the gunshot wounds when really a lot of the cause of death comes from, from infectious disease, from crowding from damage to sanitation facilities, there's no clean water, there's missed immunizations, you have a breakdown of your long-term care for TB and HIV. And typically the, the most highest mortality comes from pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, and malaria. Typically this is broken down into prevention, surveillance, outbreak detection, diagnosis and case management, and outbreak response. I'm only going to very briefly talk about this to give you a sense of what this looks like, because I hate when talks do this like overarching thing and then you don't really understand what they're talking about. So cholera, I think cholera treatment is really cool. And the reason I think cholera treatment is really cool because how often can we say that without treatment, something has a 50% mortality, but when we treat it, it has a mortality less than 1%. Not that often. Mo cholera, just as a, a fun aside, it typically involves a, a diarrhea that doesn't have blood. It's typically a fecal to oral and usually uh, involves uh, contaminated water sources. It's more common in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's present other places. And there was a very huge outbreak um, during uh, the ongoing Yemen conflict. And usually it doesn't have fever. Um, and so if you have a fever, it's typically not malaria. And if there's blood, you should be thinking about Shigella as the 50% uh, most common uh, for bloody diarrhea. So like I mentioned, you start with prevention, and that is your wash specialist. That's your water and hygiene specialist. That's clean water chlorination, and this picture is actually from Yemen. Um, you have to try to identify where should I have my latrines and designated defecation areas. You want to kind of educate on food handling, and sometimes they use vaccinations, but this is a more new concept. It's not that typically used, but could have up to a 65 percent efficacy up to five years for the Shankol, which is the one that's typically used. The Vaxcora has higher, but is only available in the U.S. You have your case definition, you're doing your surveillance, you're collecting your data, and then all of a sudden you have a case that meets the World Health Organization definition for cholera. 
And then once you have that case, you start to investigate with your team. You work with your wash specialist, your water and hygiene specialist to say, where are the gathering places? Where are people getting drinking water? Where might I have poor sanitation? Am I in a flood season? Is there a drought? And then you work with your logistics person and you say, hey, I'm a doctor. I need lactated ringers, oral rehydration supplementation. I need IV supplies. I need antibiotics. Usually it says doxycycline, but you might choose something else. And I need zinc. And I need to send my initial rapid test. So I need to know where my lab might be that I could send this rapid test and cultures to confirm the outbreak. And you need a data collection mechanism. So you confirm with your rapid tests, which are about 90% sensitive, although it's not thought to be um, confirmatory. And you send your, your cultures to try to get at what is the antibiotic sensitivity for the strain that is being treated. Because after that, you just treat as a physician for the case. You don't test anymore, you just treat. And this is just an example, just so you can get an idea, um, if you want the slides for this, about how we evaluate and treat dehydration using oral rehydration supplementation. And typically, you're, for severe dehydration, you're giving 10% of the patient's body weight um, in IV fluids, and then you start adding more oral rehydration solution um, to make up for that. And in children, you're really tracking them to say ev every time they have a stool, you're giving them more oral rehydration solution. And that's typically um, a particularly, this is the MSF guidelines, but there's, there's others as to how much you give um, using these tablets that you see here. These are UNICEF tablets um, and how much you give. And then you give your, your antibiotic therapy, which as I mentioned, is typically single dose doxycycline. It could also be azithro and cipro, which has the nice added effect that it also um, can treat Shigella. And then you do zinc supplementation. And that's typically, by the way, supposed to be given within four hours of um, identification. And then you do your zinc supplementation over a 10 day course. The outbreak response is a really interesting part of this because as a physician, you're involved in these decision makings so MSF, for example, before they were are, are going to plan a cholera outbreak, they start to say, this is what we've seen before. Um, and so they'll say things like about 30% of patients will have severe dehydration, 30 to 40 will have some, 30 to 40 will have nothing. And then about, uh, oh, excuse me, all patients with severe dehydration and about half of patients with some dehydration will need a bed for a night, About which means that about 50% of all the cholera patients you're seeing are gonna need a bed your average uh, inpatient stay is two days. And then they calculate how much uh, fluids they typically use for dehydrated patients based on you know, how dehydrated they are. And then they calculate the antibiotic and zinc need and plus a buffer stock of 15%. And that's how they calculate the treatment resource needs. This is an example of how they would calculate, for example, for a refugee camp or an urban area and how those calculations would be different. And then you have your MSF cholera treatment centers, which you have to plan based on your initial assessment as to where that these are the most needed. And really, so these go, there's clean areas and then there's dirty areas. And you have to kind of go in the same, you know, circular setting so that you're keeping your clean areas clean, your dirty areas dirty, and using your wash specialist to identify where latrines and those other kinds of things have to be. Who's who in humanitarian emergencies is another uh, critical topic because it involves coordination. We know coordination is difficult in conflict zones. And one kind of example of this is how many different types of actors are, are really playing a role. And you have to kind of understand how you fit into this whole bigger picture. You have United Nations organizations. For example, um, in our part of the world, we have UNRWA, um, UNHCR as well, um, the Palestinian refugee organizations. There are funding agents and donors. There's a million NGOs. You have your military your national government, and then your Red Cross, Red Crescent organizations. And to make that more complicated, we have, for example, the local uh, Magen David Adom, and from the Israeli side, the Palestinian Red Crescent, um, from the Palestinian side, and then the international um, ICRC, which is supposed to be a neutral agent. And then you thought, oh, but NGOs are simple, but they're not. There's religious organizations, there's secular organizations, there's sector specific, for example, I only work with children or I only work on diabetes. And there's also local versus international NGOs. And all of these are kind of put together in a cluster approach. And so what happens is you have um, OCHA, which is the UN uh, uh, humanitarian organization. There's an undersecretary general for humanitarian affairs who becomes the emergency relief coordinator in an emergency. He also assigns a humanitarian coordinator who is usually the, the country expert from the UN on that particular issue. 
And then they run all of these other clusters. For example, the health cluster, which we're obviously the most interested in, is run by the World Health Organization. Nutrition is run by UNICEF. And you have these inner cluster meetings where all the different health teams will meet to talk about um, their, their organization. And then I think it cannot be you know, understated that when we go and we, we are trying to decide if we're going to um, really impact a humanitarian emergency, you cannot just hop in a plane and expect that you are going to be useful. Do no harm applies not only in our emergency department, but applies when we go abroad. Perhaps the most egregious example of this is Goma. Many of us today are familiar with what happened in Rwanda. In Rwanda, Hutu extremist militias killed over 800,000 Tutsis and Hutu sympathizers. It was one of the largest genocides of the 20th century. On July 14th and 15th, 10 to 12,000 refugees crossed the border into Zaire, which is present day DRC or Democratic Congo, Republic of the Congo per hour. Think about that number. That's a number per hour, 12,000 per hour. And the result was 1.2 million Hutu refugees which flowed into North Kivu, which then became, uh, were kind of forced into Goma. And it's so interesting because Goma was actually like a Belgian when, you know, Belgium, um, you know, owned that area. It was like an idyllic colonial retreat. And then this area became hell on earth um, as 1.2 million Hutu refugees flowed into the region. They were forced away from Lake Kivu and turned into a volcanic area where you couldn't dig latrines. There was dehydration, there was malnutrition, and we talked about how important it is the wash specialists, the water and unit, um, the water and hygiene for cholera. And so, as one would expect, based on what we just talked about, there was a significant cholera outbreak. Forty-eight thousand Rwandan refugees would die during the first month in the Goma area, and there was one day where seven thousand people died in one day. And why did this happen? Rwanda is sort of said to be the ultimate failure. It's the failure to intervene, to halt the genocide, but then it's also the failure to respond. There was about 200 organizations and two, uh, $2 billion that were put into this response in Goma. Many organizations arrived and said, hi, I'm a humanitarian NGO, but they had no previous experience and they didn't have any training. The proliferation of responders resulted not only in a duplication of efforts and wasted resources, but in some egregious case, unnecessary losses of life. There were reports of being people being put on IV drips for cholera and then nobody checking on them and just leaving. There was inadequately trained and equipped personnel. There were other sectors where people had in their, there was no cluster at that time. And so people said, um, you know, I'm gonna cover this particular sector and then they didn't do so. And so there was whole sectors of care missing. And then there were people who were unwilling or unable to coordinate activities. There was also a high level of insecurity in the refugee camp and Hutu militia members started to use the camp as really just an extension of a way to kind of go back and reconquer Rwanda and the level of violence was quite high. And the, the absolute uh, failure of, of those efforts led to the sphere guidelines, which are currently the sort of the set principles and minimum humanitarian standards that if you are going to deploy to a conflict zone, you must absolutely read before you go. And that involves WASH, food security, nutrition, shelter and settlement and health. And it's really a practical document about how to uh, manage health in humanitarian emergencies. You might. Um, another example of do no harm and what that means is Haiti. You might recognize the person in the picture. Um, so, Haiti had a lot of different failures, one of which was quality control. There was reports of residents doing things unsupervised and medical students doing things unsupervised. If you shouldn't do it at home, you should not do it there. That's kind of the rule. People were taking hotel spaces um, away from not only reputable aid organizations, but also people who were looking for um, a place after being displaced. There was varying triage criteria. And I think the most critical thing was the care referral coordination. One example of this that Dr. Buck shared with me was that he was working um, in an area and 
he noticed that he needed uh, someone to treat someone with a globe rupture, and they didn't know that there was an ophthalmology clinic in that facility, and so they didn't refer because they didn't know, and then they had to later try to find a child with a globe rupture and bring them back um, to try to go to the facility, which was on the same campus that they were at, and they didn't know it was there. The biggest of these crises, however, and this was sort of identified by the World Health Organization afterwards, was what's called the renal crisis. The amount of crush injuries in Haiti causing rhabdomyolysis was very, very high. There was an organization called the Renal Disaster Relief Task Force, which was part of the International Society of Nephrology, um, which was strong in expertise for how to conduct dialysis, but really weak on logistics. Um, there was a dialysis center with eight units, and it was operational on day five in Haiti, which is really important to note because typically you start to see rhabdomyolysis and severe renal injuries on day four to ten after the trauma. So they were there in time, but nobody knew they were there. And so while pe you know different organizations were treating higher and higher numbers of crush injuries and uh, renal failure, they didn't have those anywhere to send these patients for dialysis because they didn't know that this, this center was there. And so while this dialysis center could really accommodate up to 200 patients, they ran at 20% of their capacity and only treated 19 people. And part of the failure was identified was that they didn't participate in the cluster meetings that we talked about earlier. They weren't involved in a lot of the health cluster meetings. And part of this was the sort of described failure of the World Health Organization to do a really adequate job of their initial assessment. They used languages that were inappropriate. They weren't, the assessment wasn't appropriate to the Haitian context. And it also, the, uh, the interview and the, the survey questions lasted three hours. And I asked you who was going to do a three-hour survey. I may have tried, but it's not a good idea. Um, and so... Just add one thing about that. Yes. Um, a lot of folks who were involved in that response came away scarred by the cluster system. And you could they just use a different word for the cluster system. Uh, <laughs> the, um, but then as I... Have been involved in more and more um, incidents internationally. You see the. Um, I said at that point the cluster system was a toddler crawling through a disaster. That was the level of development that it had. And then throughout other um, um, additional events, you start to see the maturity of it um, and the ability to uh, for WHO to coordinate these meetings. Um, and and now becomes, it might be a little dysfunctional because there's multiple languages and the French are in the quarter smoking cigarettes, um, which is always hilarious to me in the health meeting. But um, now, now it's become, if you're not there, you are nobody and you are non-actor. It probably means that you do not have permission from the government to be acting in that area. And so the, the cluster system has really matured. Um, you know, other areas of failure that were discussed were post-operative care and follow-up. There was an, a really, a really large amount of amputations that occurred due to cross injuries in Haiti, and there was not a lot of discussion of the day after and who's going to do their post-operative care. There were also a lot of foreign medical evacuations. As you might realize, Haiti is actually quite close to Miami, and so a lot of people were transported to the United States and their family didn't know where they were. And it was also seen as, is this the really the right way to use our resources? I want to just take a final second to talk about some of the upcoming challenges that I see um, in working in the humanitarian space. The top picture uh, depicts Syrian refugees returning to Syria for cancer treatment, which I find absolutely an amazing, the unbelievable thing that is occurring. Um, it's happening in the both Lebanon and Jordan. And part of the reason that it's happening you know, Paul Spiegel, who was the um, UNHCR previous medical director, did a study between 2010 and 2012, and they found that around a quarter of applications for help were for um, cancer treatment costs, and more than half of these were declined because the patient either the you know faced a poor prognosis or the cost of treating them was too high. The bottom picture depicts a Syrian refugee in Lebanon. Um, who, who needs dialysis, and you can imagine the cost of ongoing dialysis for a conflict that's ongoing for over a decade. Non-communicable disease and conflict is my particular, one of my particular areas of study, and I could do an entire talk on this topic alone, but needless to say that as low and middle income countries have higher rates of non-communicable disease, they also have higher rates of conflict, and the number of, of people who have non-communicable diseases and conflict zones are rising. 
The ICRC has reported that in more than half of the countries in which they're currently operational, the diabetes prevalence is over 10%. And, and that should just sort of suggest to you how big this problem is. And one example of um, the problem of not focusing on this came to light in a, a coup in Mali in 2012 when OCHA and UNICEF, and by the way, UNICEF is the UN um, kind of pedi or ch child agency, um, and OCHA is the humanitarian assistance agency, and there was a local NGO called Santa Diabetes who turned to these agencies and said, hey, there's a lot of people with diabetes here. We need help. And the response from OCHA, and this is their quote, not mine, so I can't verify it. But they said that OCHA said that diabetes is not in the framework and not an emergency. And they said that UNICEF stated that diabetes is not a priority. So they started, and this was a development agency, they started to create kits with insulin, Dinkin solution, glucose test strips, monitors, antibiotics, wound dressings. And then they moved all kids who had type 1 diabetes out of critical areas or the higher areas of fighting because of the high risk of DKA. MSF has been doing really fantastic work in this area. For example, one of the problems had traditionally been that insulin had to be stored at temperatures um, below 25 degrees for 42 days. And MSF has shown that really you can store it between 25 and 37 degrees, um, which is really opening up doors for treatment for insulin. And so it's really incredible uh, work. Besides non-communicable diseases just being a problem in and of itself, we are seeing more and more uh, protracted conflicts today, which means that we're in that acute emergency phase, we go to the post-emergency phase, and we can't quite get out of this cycle. And if you think about conflicts like Syria, it's been ongoing for a decade, that means that we have to start treating, uh, thinking about preventative care, long-term primary care for things like diabetes, hypertension. These people have these problems, and just like anybody else, and if they're a refugee for 20 years, they need treatment. And this sort of brings us to this kind of newer controversial topic of the new nexus between humanitarian aid and development aid. Traditionally, there was humanitarian actors who followed humanitarian principles, and then there was development aid, um, which was at peace times. And now we're starting to say, maybe we need to work together to create long-term responses. And that's the sort of a, a new nexus, which brings a whole other uh, realm of controversies and complications. I also want to draw attention to the fact that when many of you think about humanitarian emergencies and humanitarian response, most of you will probably think about something that looks like this. This is Zatari refugee camp um, in northern Jordan. It's a camp that hosts 80,000 Syrian refugees and has become really a symbol of the long running Syrian refugee crisis. Um, there are eight medical facilities. I also have been to a TB center there um, and 32 different UN agencies working um, in this place. But does this really represent the sort of the typical scenario in which you will be, will be providing care? And the answer is becoming increasingly no. Um, this area here, um, some of you may recognize who have been to Israel, but this is actually outside of the, the bus station in central Tel Aviv. And these are um, Sudanese and Eritrean refugees. And I put this here to suggest to you that many refugees are being um, hosted and need to be cared for in urban settings. And that changes the entire way. If you think about the cholera treatment center, you can't do that in an urban setting. And so you really need to think about different ways in, we, in which we need to work both from a healthcare perspective um, and trying to provide uh, care and asylum to um, persons who are displaced. Um, for those who are interested in learning more, um, GEMA, the SAM group that um, I co-chair with Vinay Kampala from CHOP, we have a, um, this is our QR code and we have a humanitarian resource list which we update and you can download that has information on different trainings that are available, some of which are free um, and some of which, you know, you have to sign up for and go to and also different aid organizations that we have worked with in the past and are reputable. I want to end today's talk with a quote from a very famous Palestinian poet, uh, Mahmoud Darwish. He wrote, as you think of others far away, think of yourself. Say, if only I were a candle in the dark. And this is the end of a poem that he wrote that I have read hundreds of times. And when I was making this talk, I kept thinking about this, this quote.
because I think it's not only important to think of those who are far away and suffering, but to think of yourself and think of your preparation and how you can contribute and if you can contribute and what are the appropriate ways to contribute. Because if we think about those things as emergency medicine physicians, our skills are transferable if we take the extra steps and we can provide light to so many people in the world who only have darkness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leff. That was outstanding. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the end. Again, I apologize for the audio issues, but I'm confident that you are grateful for hearing her presentation nonetheless. We have an amazing episode for you in April, so come back on April Fool's Day for the next chapter of the show. Send us ideas for future episodes like Dr. John Gall did recently, who emailed us. We appreciate all of your advice and insights and hopefully make the show better for you in the long run. If you feel comfortable, hit the thumbs up button on our podcast. Thank you for listening. The Always On EM Podcast. Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds.